Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the throng of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. I know. So my friends, this is where the Gospel of Mark begins. No baby, no angels, No mother mild or shepherds quaking at the sight or magi following yonder star. No, Mark's gospel starts at a river. Rivers are tricky places. I've actually been looking at the news the last couple of days, my hometown, Mystic. Have you seen it? The river has run its banks. Friends of ours have the river now as their front yard and filling their basement. Growing up every summer, we camped alongside the Penobscot River in northern Maine. Have you heard of that? I was just reading an article about how they're starting to remove some of the dams along the Penobscot River. It was a wild place. Still is, really. There's no running water except for the racing river. There were no bathrooms except for stinky outhouses. No electricity, just flashlights and gas lanterns. When the river was low, it was relatively tame and calm. Chilly, up in northern Maine, but swimmable. When the river was high, it was thrilling and probably a bit dangerous with its swiftly moving currents. Very young, I learned that you don't take the river for granted but must always be vigilant, and you need to know two very important things. Your limits and the water's power. Water is one of the most powerful elements on the planet. It can carve out a vast canyon through hardened rock. It can flatten terrain, and it has the power to sustain life. Our own bodies are estimated to be about two-thirds composed of water. And tragically, the world is struggling to maintain clean and healthy water, while climate change is causing our oceans and rivers to flood and overflow. Don't underestimate water. Well, water in the Bible is always associated with God's sacred power and presence. God reigns the chaos of it in at creation, and God parts it to make a way for God's people. And here in our text this morning, it is the substance that is called upon to make things new. So in the particular river, Jordan, Jesus is being commissioned. His ministry is being blessed and inaugurated, and it begins at the river, in the wilderness with the likes of a man named John, who wore rugged clothes and ate wild things. John was preaching a message of repentance, a message of change. And look, people were flocking to him. 
Did you ever wonder why? Because they had a longing for things to be made new, right? For change. And so in the Gospel of Mark, it all begins at the water where Jesus comes and rinsed in those churning waters, he begins his work to make such dreams of God come true. The text says that just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. Listen to how Mark phrases this. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, the skies are opened up, but here in Mark, they're what? What did I just say? Ooh, that's hard, isn't it? Torn apart. Not just opened up. Torn apart. Hmm. Why torn apart? It's important to notice these things, especially when you've got four Gospels all sharing the same story. Why do they tell it differently? Why does Mark say torn apart? The Greek word here is a form of the verb schizo, as in schism or schizophrenia. It's not the same word as open. I open the book. I close the book. It is still whole. It's the same thing. But, friends, something that is torn apart is not so easily put back together again, is it? The ragged edges never go back to the way they were. Mark wasn't careless in using that word, schizo. He remembered Isaiah's plea centuries before when the prophet cried out to God, Oh, that you would tear the heavens open and come down to make your name known to your enemies and make the nations tremble at your presence. And the Gospel of Mark continues that a voice came out of that torn place and said, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This voice is intimate, calling to a loved one out of that torn heaven. You are blessed. And listen, all you who would witness this moment, Mark says, the heavens were torn apart and they will never close again. When I was a child, our family spent a lot of time at our little country church in Old Mystic, Connecticut. We had acres of land with a softball field, a big fire pit where we camped sometimes, and a huge garden out back. And I remember trying to find things to do while my parents literally spent millions of hours at church every week. One of my favorite things to do was to go out in the field far enough where I couldn't hear anything or anyone anymore, or God, be, God forbid be called in to volunteer to go do something. And so I lay in the grass under an expanse of sky. It was my wonder time. It was, I suppose, my prayer time. The sky was huge, and out in that field, the sweet smell of grass always takes me back to that place where I wondered about God and people who were awfully confusing. And I wondered why. And the sky and I just got it. There were no voices, there were no answers, just mystery. And you know what, that was okay. The sky and I just got it. The thing is though, that I will never be able to replicate that experience. The smell of summer grass will still transport me to that field, but my wondering is different now. 
my questions are different. Beyond the fact that my church has since closed and been sold after 307 years, the truth of it is, my childhood faith has changed. It has been torn in many places, and the edges will never meet up the same way again. But this is the truth I have learned since that girl gazed into a sacred sky. Friends, God shows up in the torn places. The places where the edges don't mesh very easily and the seams are like scars from the failures, the mistakes, or simply just the changes in direction, that is where God appears in the torn places, which is what Jesus came to show us. That all of our assumptions, our smooth and easy assumptions about the world and how it works aren't quite so neat and easy. You see, this Jesus is the one who came to tear apart the social fabric between rich and poor. He came to tear open our hearts so that we would know compassion. He came to tear apart the chains of oppression and injustice. He came to tear up the notion of what it means to be Messiah, to be servant instead of ruler. The heavens were torn apart and they were never close again. Is there a torn place in your life, I wonder? Some rent fabric that just won't mend without a ragged seam. Listen, there's a voice in that place whispering to your soul. You are my beloved, it says, and I am leaving you a blessing in that space. I end with this story from Barbara Lundblad, who said, I remember a young woman, 30-something I think she was, we sat talking in my office at church. She told me that when she was seven or eight, her mother gave her a book of Bible stories. She loved that book, and she read it over and over again. In fact, she read it so much that her mother feared that she was becoming a religious fanatic. So one day, Her mother took the book away and told her to read other things. Not wanting to upset her mother, the girl left the stories of God behind, all through school, all through college. Years later, her life was falling apart. What she wanted to tell me about that day was about her Good Friday, not that she'd gone to church. She remembered it was Good Friday because she had the afternoon off from work. Her hopes for a career in music were going nowhere, and the man she loved had just ended their relationship. So that afternoon, she went into her apartment and locked the door. She went into her bedroom, turned off the lights, pulled down the shades, and put some music on the stereo. She couldn't remember for sure. She thought maybe it was Bach, maybe the St. Matthew's Passion. After all, it was Good Friday. In the darkness, she lay down to try to forget everything, to shut out everything except for the music. Then suddenly, she told me, the room was filled with light. She couldn't explain it. The room was dark. The shades were down, but the room was filled with light. She wasn't near death or hallucinating. She wasn't feeling sick. She only knew that the room was filled with light. It was for her a turning point, the first step back to the stories that had been torn from her hands as a young girl It was the presence of God coming through the torn places in her own life. A year later, she was baptized at the Easter vigil, surrounded by a circle of candlelight. Under the water, under the word, you are my own beloved child. The torn place was still there, but God was in it. Amen.